All right, thank you. So uh, welcome to our first discussion session for the first theoretical exercises on C programming. This is for operating systems. We'll have a, a separate session for compiler construction, which will be absolutely identical tomorrow. So essentially, uh, if you're in both courses, obviously you only need to take it once. Uh, so uh, we started with uh, discussing C programming first. Uh, because some of you have uh, not programmed that much in C before or don't have that much experience. And uh, I wanted to give you some hints to some very specific C-related problems that you don't see in managed languages like Java or uh, Swift, Swift from Apple or something like that. So we had a number of questions and we're going to publish also a written answer sheet later on uh, so you can compare your answers and you'll also get feedback from our student TAs on your submitted exercises. Um, this might take a couple of days because I don't want my TAs to work on the weekend. They, they also have to study and work on their master thesis, obviously. All right, so the first C program we had was this one here. So we just included the standard IO header declared a variable and A equals 23 at a function word increment with value, which got two parameters A and B. And this added B to the value of A. And then we have a main function here, which doesn't get any parameters, which calls increment with value A. And the second parameter is just a constant one and returns A. So the idea here was to have you think about what this program does. So without compiling and running it, you should indicate which value is returned by the main function. And this is a typical piece of code demonstrating the overlaying or shadowing of variable names in C. So you see we have a variable A on top here and A equals 23. And we have another variable A, which is the parameter to our function increment with value. So these have the same name, but they are different variables, obviously. So main, doesn't have any local declaration of a variable called a. And this means main sees the, well, uh, the value of the, well, only a it can see, so which is our global variable here. So main always works with our global variable a, which we initialize to 23 before the program starts. So when main calls increment with value and passes a, it passes this value of a by value, it means it just copies the value over to our function. So it doesn't pass a pointer or a reference or anything. So this means it reads the value of a, which is 23, it copies it over to that function, and then it ends up in that variable here, which is also called a, but this is a different variable because this is a local variable here. So what increment with value does is it has a copy of that value, which is stores in its own local variable a, increments this value of a, which is 23, by the parameter b, which was 1, which gives us a result of 24. And it writes it back to our, its local variable a. Now, note that increment with value is a void function, so it doesn't return any value. So essentially, what happens is after we return from increment of with value, the value of a is simply thrown away. So essentially, uh, a modern compiler would actually optimize this whole instruction away because it would figure out nobody's ever using this value we assigned here. So when we return to main after incrementing or after calling the increment function, a still has the original value of its global variable here, so of 23. So the function returns 23. So this is something you need to care about and this is a common source of errors. If you have very short variable names, uh, well, uh, you can easily overlook that you've overloaded a variable name somewhere. You don't have stuff like namespaces or something you might be used to or uh, objects where you can store stuff. So this is pretty primitive and something you need to care about because these bugs are hard to find. Okay, so that was a first introduction. I think that wasn't too difficult, I hope. So uh, the next uh, question was considering the same program and now just uh, finding out about symbols. Uh, we had this introduction to symbols in our C crash course and we've seen the NM tool, NM short for names. So the Unix people try to abbreviate everything so they don't have to type that much. Uh, 
So if I run nm and then test on our test executable, uh, and I look at the addresses and I see the nm output does not print a memory address for the variable b. b is our local variable here. So it's a second parameter for the function increment with value. So b is just local. There is no global variable called b. And that's exactly the reason why nm cannot print any address for it. nm does a static analysis of the binary, which means it looks at all the information uh, included in the binary like addresses of variables where the addresses are known. And these are only known for variables that are statically allocated. So global initialized values like our int a variable up here, uninitialized variables, variables declared static inside of functions, and the name of functions like main and increment with value. B is on the stack because it's a local variable. So the location of B changes throughout the life of the program, especially if we would call increment value again recursively or something like this. And the location of B depends on the stack location in memory. This depends on what your operating system chose to use as a stack location or a stack memory range. And if we call a function recursively, the call depth, because for every recursive invocation, we get another copy of A and B here, because they're local variables that are only valid inside of that one uh, invocation. So essentially, our static analysis, uh, well, is unable to retrieve the address of B. We can only get it at runtime, and NM just looks at the compiled program. It doesn't run it. All right, I don't see any questions in the chat so far, so I'll just continue. So part A was this program here, which included a standard io.h and string.h because we used uh, the print function, printf function and string copy. And the main function uh, declared a number of variables, an int variable foo, which was initialized to zero, a character variable s, which holds 12 characters, and a pointer to a string or a character pointer, which pointed to this long string here. And uh, the first question was, uh, what's the value printed for foo afterwards? And some of you actually tried it out and figured out, uh, well, it crashes. Yes, on modern compilers, it crashes. But that was exactly the intention of uh, writing without compiling and running it. So first thinking about it, what would happen if, if we just would naively like uh, follow the instructions of that program? So it depends on the protective measures your C compiler employs. But on old C compilers, or if you switch off the measures, you see S is an array of 12 characters. So it uses 12 bytes. And these 12 bytes are on the stack because the variables are local. And we have a variable foo, which takes usually four bytes. And this is located after s on the stack. So it does it in the order. It allocates variables in the order they're shown here. And the stack grows downwards. So this is why foo comes on upper addresses. And below that comes s. So what happens when we execute string copy is that string copy doesn't know that this element s has tw only 12 storage spaces available for characters. And if you look at that string, this is 14 characters in length. In, uh, plus an additional zero character at the end, indicating the string end. So string copy acts really stupid and copies these 14 bytes plus the terminating zero characters to the memory space, which is started at the first element of S, so S of zero. And so it writes the 12 bytes of S, and then it just continues writing, and it continues to write all the uh, remaining bytes over the contents of our foo variable here. So this is a classical buffer overflow, a typical C security problem that happens very often and is the cause of for almost half of the security problems actually you get nowadays. Uh, S of 12 stores, so the question is, does a character S of 12 store 12 letters or 11 letters L the zero, and the zero? So it stores 12 characters, including the zero at the end. So you can only have 11 letters and then you need to reserve a space for the zero. Right. So essentially, the four bytes or some of the four bytes where foo is stored are overwritten. So when we read foo in the last printf line here, well, we got something that is unexpected. So what do we get? Well, we get the last bytes here. So we have 12 bytes until the one here. 
And the last two bytes of our character string t are the ASCII characters for the digits two and three. And these are overwriting the first two bytes of foo. Then we have a terminating zero at the end. And the last byte of foo just remains zero because we had initialized that variable to zero before. So the digit two has a decimal number, a decimal value in ASCII of 50, digit three has a value of 51, and zero is of course zero. And yeah, the question comes uh, that comes up, uh, I'll discuss this right now. So the four bytes uh, in foo that are overwritten, so the first three are overwritten by byte 50, 51, and two zeros. And the value that actually is printed for foo, and that was a question in the chat, depends on the byte order. So processors can have a so-called little endian byte order where the least significant bits are stored in the lowest address of a four, four byte word. That's most common processors today. So like Intel, uh, AMD, x86, uh, most ARM processors, uh, RISC-V and so on. So only if you have a very old Sun machine with a Spark processor, you might have a big Andean machine. So on little Andean machines, we have uh, the least significant bits. And in the first byte, so 50 is the least significant bit, so it is multiplied by one. Then 51 is the next byte, so it's multiplied by 256 plus two zero bytes. And if I'm not mistaken, this is one, uh, 13,106 as the value that came out. So yes, it depends on the endianness of the computer. Uh, so if you had a big endian computer, uh, it would be different and I can't really make this out in my head, sorry. <laughs> okay, so question, yeah. What's the motivation for storing the least significant byte first? Isn't that pretty strange? Yes, good question. So essentially you can uh, do uh, arithmetic operations uh, in, in two ways, obviously little and big endian. And uh, when you do a big endian addition and you start at the first byte, you, uh, you end up adding the uh, most significant bytes first. So when you figure out later on that you have a carry over to some more significant byte. So if, for example, the last two bytes were of two numbers you had were 255 each, you would have to fix up all the other bytes. And if you start from the least significant bytes first, you can just add the carry while you're going along over the bytes. That's one of the advantages. A disadvantage is uh, if you're connecting to the internet because the internet was created on big Andean machines. And so all the internet protocols order their bytes in big Andean order. So you have to swap all the bytes around when you implement like TCP IP protocols uh, on a little Andean machine like an Intel machine. So the problem that showed up is of course that a traditional C compiler provides no memory protection. So it, it doesn't check how many bytes are available in S, it actually doesn't know because it's, S is just a pointer to some arbitrary character in memory, which by coincidence stores 12 bytes. So string copy doesn't check it. That's why everyone recommends now never use string copy. There are more, uh, there are safer functions like strn copy, which uh, can be passed a parameter, uh, which indicates the maximum number of characters to copy. So uh, we write over the end of the buffer, we spill into foo as we've seen, and this is a classic example. So if you're interested in security, uh, IT security and the mechanisms behind attacks, this is probably one of the first examples you're going to see how to create a buffer overflow in C. Why, are, why is C doing it that way? Well, it's fast because if you needed to check it, you would need to check at every access to this RAS if the index or the pointer would be inside of the range. This is very expensive. So this costs like a factor of three in performance sometimes. And C was really built for small machines, which were slow. So the inventors of C just uh, got away with it and they were happy with it. So yes. <laughs> uh, and of course it's a shame because that's the reason why we shouldn't use C today, but we can't get around it. So maybe we'll switch to Rust in some upcoming semesters as somebody proposed already, but we'll need to get up to speed with Rust ourselves first. All right, and the third part of the question was uh, find out which command line option can be used to enable the stack protection. So you've seen that on a real system like a modern Linux or Mac system, the program will crash with the segmentation fault or similar. This is the indication that the compiler added code 
to catch this typical buffer overflow and modern C compiler have protections against this. For example, they reorder variables on the stack so that the uh, strings are always in a position where they can't interfere with any other variables. And uh, you can, for example, enable this by using an option dash F no stack protect, which is sometimes required for uh, successfully compiling older programs. And if you're interested in this, so this is a detail, there's an interesting link on a blog uh, on this blog article here, which is a couple of years older, but which gives you quite a good overview of what's actually possible. And the final question in 1.3 was, what would the output be if we changed line five here by adding a static keyword in front of int foo? And does this really solve the underlying problem? Now, declaring a variable as static inside of a function, this is a very special case of static. And this indicates to the compiler that the value of static should be retained across function calls. So whenever we would enter main the next time during the run of our program, the value we stored in foo the last time would still be there. So this is very uncommon for main because you're usually not calling main again, obviously. But for the compiler, main is just a function like any other. So it honors this static qualifier here. And uh, this means that it is unable to store the value of foo on, it, on the local stack because the local stack would just be thrown away when main ends uh, and main could be called again if, if we built it that way. So static means the compiler stores this variable like a global variable, almost like a global variable, because if you already had a global variable called foo up here, well, then you'd have a conflict. So the compiler actually adds some identifier to foo, like foo underline zero or something like that internally to be able to distinguish between these. You can see this in NM actually, when you run NM on such a program that this variable foo here gets a special name. So a is stored outside of the stack. So now when we overwrite S, we don't overwrite foo because foo is somewhere completely different in memory. So we are unable to overwrite foo any longer, but we overwrite something else on the stack. And what this is depends on your computer architecture, on your stack setup. Very often uh, the value stored above all the local uh, variables is the return address. So the address of the function that called main in this case. So uh, for general, uh, if, 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 it's, if it's main, it's a very special function, obviously, which is called by system functions. Uh, but anyways, this is valid for any function. So for example, this would override the return address. So when we would return from main, it would jump somewhere else because it now has a different address on the stack. And this is one of the other very common uh, attacks, so-called return-oriented programming. So you overflow the stack uh, by overwriting the return address to some address you know, for example, the address of a function inside of your program that formats your hard disk. And then your attacker can actually force your program to call this hard disk formatting function. And you would be really surprised that your hard disk was empty after exiting your program. So this is another serious security problem you have to cope with and something to have, you have to care about. But of course, modern C compilers also protect against this. All right, and the final question was about functions and variables again. So uh, you should determine which memory sections are the function rec, the variable cd and counter and a, as well as parameter. And there was an error in the, in the question, actually not a, but we wanted the parameter number. Sorry for that. So that was probably easy. Rec is a function, so it's in the text segment because text contains all the executable program code. C is a const variable. You maybe have seen this or not. So in very many systems, this const variable actually, uh, con uh, or const variables have a special write protected memory segment, which is called RO data. You can check with NM on your system if this is in data or in RO data. D is an uninitialized global variable. So it's in this BSS segment. Counter is initialized here to zero. So it is in the data segment because we have to deliver its value along with the program. A is a local variable in main, so it's on the stack. You can't see it in NM. And the parameter number is a parameter, but parameters work like any local variables inside of that function. So it's a local variable in rec, so it's also on the stack. What happens if you execute the compiled program? Well, that was a bit mean maybe. So rec 
recursively calls rec again in this return statement. So when we call rec here for the first time, we enter rec, we increment our counter, and then we call rec of counter again. But you see there is no terminating condition. So we're doing an endless recursion, always calling rec. And so for every invocation of rec, for every recursive invocation, it creates a new stack frame containing our number variable and our counter uh, and, and our, uh, no, just the number variable here and the return address, obviously, because counter is a global variable. And this means if we called it like 10,000 times, we'd already use 80 kilobytes on the stack. And if it, you, your computers are fast nowadays, so if we called it several millions of times, you would run out of memory because the stack always grows downwards. So for every recursive invocation, we get a different, an additional stack frame. So it eats up more and more memory and it hits the top of our heap uh, where memory lives, which we allocate with L uh, malloc. And the operating system usually catches this and terminates your program. So your program will crash because you, you didn't catch uh, the end of the recursion. You just caused the stack to grow and grow more. So the second part is what changes if you add a local variable character array of 1000 here to the local variables in rec. Well, your local stack frame would be 1000 bytes larger. So essentially you would have fewer iterations until it crashes because now for each recursive iteration, it would not only allocate eight bytes, but 1008 bytes. So essentially it would reach the top of the heap faster. So essentially it would crash earlier, but this is very difficult to measure on modern systems because modern computers are simply so fast. So essentially I, I couldn't really figure it out on my system here. Probably I need to, to dig into our museum to get a really old machine to test this, to see if we can measure the difference. So essentially you have to take care of stuff like this, especially if you use recursions because they can eat up memory really fast and then you have crashes that are sometimes hard to debug. So these were the questions we had and I'll stop the recording now. So if there are any additional questions, uh, you can also feel free to step up to the microphone if I find my recording button. So where is it? <laughs> 